Let us bow in prayer. Most gracious and loving God, your creative presence as at work each moment of each day bringing life. Your eternal love is always near, seeking to draw us closer and closer to your heart. Help us to be open to your closeness each day. Help us to be open to you in a special way in these next few moments. And may you be pleased to use my words, all of our thoughts, all of our meditations, that through them and in spite of them, we might be drawn closer to you, gain an added measure of your truth and of your love. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> Friends, it's Remembrance Day, as you well know. And so at the 11th hour of the 11th day <clears throat> of the 11th month in 1918, 100 years ago today, the guns fell silent all over the world. Today, on Remembrance Day, we are marking the 100th anniversary since the end of the First World War. But as we know, it was only a mere 21 years later that a new world war began in September of 1939, and many of you will remember that. A war that would last nearly full six years. Canadians continued to take part in other wars throughout the world, including the Korean War at the beginning of the 1950s, which many of you will remember, the peacekeeping missions starting in the 1960s, the war in Afghanistan in the early 2000s, and other military actions throughout the world. In all wars, as you know, lives of soldiers and civilians, men and women, children and adults are lost, communities and nations destroyed, taking years and sometimes generations to recover. Today, as in every Remembrance Day, we pause in the routine of our lives, we pause in the midst of the busyness of a modern, wealthy nation, which does not pause for much, to remember the cost of our blessings, the cost to real people in the past and also the present, who have served and continue to serve the nation in times of war and times of peace. For those of us, like myself, born after the Second World War, it's hard to imagine or to remember the cost of war for a whole generation of people, which some of you who are older will remember that cost, what that was like. So when we gather, for some of us who are younger, we can, for example, on Remembrance Day, be reminded of our history. And we can think about maps and strategy, battles and conflicts, we can look at statistics and diplomatic successes and failures. We can look at economic and social impacts of the world wars in particular. And so as you would know, particularly in the first world war in Canada, we were a nation with only 8 million people. But we put in eventually an army of 620,000 people, meaning one of the li leading military forces in the war. And of that number, 67,000 Canadians lost their lives, and 250,000 were wounded. So that means that roughly 10.8% of the entire Canadian population was in uniform. Today, if we translated that into our numbers, that would mean the same as having, in today, an army, an armed forces of 3 million 960,000 people. That's how big an impact that was for this country years ago. As a result of the First World War, history tells us that Canada grew in its independence from the British Empire. It laid the groundwork for a modern, industrialized, fully independent democracy. And while that analysis and those statistics are interesting and help us understand our country, we, today, we remember more than just statistics or facts of history. Today, we are called to remember real people from each community across this nation, from every culture and every religion and every language group in this land. We're called to remember the cost and the sacrifice given by real members of our community, our families, and our nation. I want to tell you a story about four years ago, when Anna, my wife, and I traveled to England to visit our son, who was living there, and, and his fiancée. 
Four years ago, you might remember, was 2014. It was the marking of the 100th anniversary of the beginning of the First World War. And in London, what the British were doing was they had made ceramic poppies and they were placing them in the ground in the dry moat around the Tower of London, which is like a huge fortress. And sometimes they placed them on wires coming down the side of the castle to the ground. And there was a sea of red that went around the castle. And this sea of red involved 888,000 poppies. Each poppy represented a British or Commonwealth soldier who died in the First World War. When you saw that picture, you were overwhelmed and humbled by the cost of lives lost in that war. And the sheer numbers were staggering. So on Remembrance Day, we remember things like that, the tremendous cost of war. We remember all those who died and gave themselves in service to the nation. We also remember the survivors, those who came home, who were injured, who were traumatized, who were never the same. At Remembrance Day, we are invited to remember that it's real people who paid the price for freedom, for the peace, security, and comfort of our nation. Real people, like people you have known in your lives, relatives of yours, friends of yours in other times of conflict. Example in my family was an uncle whose grave I visited in the Netherlands on that same trip four years ago. He was only 25 when he died in the war, only six months before the end of the Second World War, a death that I think my grandma never fully recovered from. In her house, as I was growing up, in her house she had um, a bouquet of roses that were now brown from age, and they'd been pressed under glass and framed and hung on the wall in her living room. And only later did I learn that those roses had been ordered by her son, my uncle, in August of 1944 for delivery back home in Saskatchewan. They did arrive for Christmas only a couple of weeks after she received the word of his death in November of that same year. The cost of war is real, symbolized by those ceramic poppies in London that I saw four years ago, and also those pressed roses on my grandma's wall that I saw 40 years ago. But on Remembrance Day, on this 100th anniversary of the Armistice, which is what this day was first called in 1918. We also need to remember that it was a time of hope. It was something more than just the silencing of the guns. There was a sentiment amongst returning soldiers and their families and many nations that this must never happen again. 1914 to 1918, Originally, it was called the Great War because of its devastating scale in terms of the loss of life and the lands throughout the earth where it was waged. But it was also called the War to End All Wars. You probably have heard that, remembered that, being told. There was the hope that after such devastation, after the failure of nations to work together to resolve conflict, that there would be a better way forward that war could be stopped completely because no one would want to live through it again. But the world was mistaken. A hundred years ago when the guns went silent on this date, at this, in, on this, this day, hope for a true lasting peace was, was held in the heart of millions of people around the earth. Now when you think of the word peace, for many of us will immediately think it means the absence of war or armed conflict. But true peace, however, which is longed for and spoken about in the great spiritual traditions of the earth, is much more than that. It's a peace that makes things whole and life-giving, healing for all. And maybe it's that kind of peace that we are called to create that will enable that reality of the dream of ending all wars to take place, that dream that was held when the guns stopped 100 years ago. 
In that book of Micah I read for you a few moments ago in chapter 4, we hear a prophecy from the ancient prophet about a vision, about a time when God's peace and presence will be fully known on the earth. The prophet has challenged his people to be faithful. And if you back up a few verses, you will learn that he has challenged his people because they've created a land of injustice, they have a society that's corrupt, they are a nation where the poor, the forgotten, uh, and, and the marginalized and abused are, are not paid attention to. But after that judgment, saying that's what makes life terrible and bad and ungodlike, then the vision of hope is given. He says that God will teach the nations, God will abide with the people, he will arbitrate, meaning that he will resolve the disputes amongst the nations, and a miracle of life will take place. Verse 3 says it this way, They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore, for they shall sit under their own vines, and under their own fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid, for the Lord of hosts has spoken. The vision you see is not just about an absence of armed conflict, but it is the vision of a world that works to create peace and abundance. Swords become agricultural instruments, spears for pruning, uh, hooks for tending orchards, safety in their land, a place in their own homes, and no one afraid. The vision is of a world that won't learn war or practice it anymore to resolve conflict, but will know a new way, a way given by God, a way of God's love and power that transforms all of life into a healing wholeness where each one is loved and belongs and is safe and is secure. When we remember the loss of life in the First World War and mark the centennial, we remember not only the First World War, the Second War, where 1.1 million Canadians were in uniform, where 44,000 were killed, where 54,000 were wounded. We remember those who served in the Korean War and in Afghanistan and in peacekeeping conflicts. We remember these wars and conflicts, and as we remember them, we need to do more than simply place a poppy or remember the statistics or even acknowledge the reality of the people whose lives were given in service. But we need to pick up and trust in this hope and this dream for peace that God offers us, which we've seen in the vision from Micah. In the Gospel lesson I read, Luke 7, it's a story in which Jesus is asked to heal the servant of a Gentile Roman soldier, a centurion. As you will know, Rome occupied Israel at that time. Roman soldiers would be seen as the enemy for most people. But this non-Jewish foreign soldier has a heart that is filled with compassion for the people he rules over. He's concerned for his servant who needs healing. And in the story, the Jewish members of the community lobby Jesus on his behalf to help with the healing. They say he's good to the Jewish community. He's even built the synagogue. And as Jesus listens, the centurion says, I'm not worthy of you coming to me. Just say the word and it'll be done. The statement demonstrates his faith. And he says, I'm a soldier under orders. I know about this. I give orders and it's done. If I say to a soldier, do this, he does it. So just say the word, Jesus, and my servant will be healed. Jesus is amazed at his faith and his understanding, and so the servant is healed. And then Jesus goes on to praise this non-Jewish foreign soldier for his faith and for his compassion. We, as modern people, are also under orders, called to service. Our orders are to live in faithfulness, and faithfulness, according to Christian tradition, is a lifestyle which involves loving God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and loving our neighbor as ourselves. This is not a sentimental or emotional love, but it's a selfless, giving, practical love, often risky, often demanding. It calls us to be completely transformed. This love will mean, for example, as Jesus said, that we need to pray for our enemies. We need to forgive others, maybe 70 times 7 if needed. We need to welcome the poor and the forgotten, as Jesus did. 
We need to lift up the lowly as scripture is proclaimed. We need to include the marginalized as Jesus demonstrated. We are, in other words, to live a life of justice and peace, hope and faith that changes us and the whole world. On this Remembrance Day 100 years ago, the guns went silent because of the agreed to armistice. On this Remembrance Day 100 years after the hopes of the great war to end all wars have faded, on this Remembrance Day when we remember the young of this nation buried around the world and here in Canada who have served and died in nations near and far away throughout the past hundred years, we are called once again to honor this, their sacrifice by listening to and responding to their dream and hope of a world of peace, by picking up the dream of God revealed in Scripture of a world made whole where nations shall not lift up sword against nation. We're called to honor the sacrifice of those who purchased the freedom and blessing of this land today. And with a determination, we are called to respond to our spiritual orders, which are to love God with all we are and to love our neighbor as ourselves. On this Remembrance Day, when may we remember the past, may we honor those who've given their lives, but then go one step further and decide how each of us in our own simple, ordinary way can choose to live a life of peacemaking. How in our community life together, how as a nation we can build a world where none are forgotten, where violent conflict is a history lesson, and where justice and wholeness, peace and new life are offered on all the earth. When we do that, then we will have truly honored those whose cost of service was greater than anything we can imagine. When we do that, we open ourselves to the powerful love of God who promises us the gift of a peace and a wholeness that will transform and heal all of life. Amen. Let us bow in